So hello and welcome to this first of a series of interviews as part of our Dental Business Transaction Podcasts. Um, my guest today needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the new chairman of the British Dental Association's Principal Executive Committee, Dr. Eddie Crouch. Eddie, thank you very much for joining me today. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm really well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to talk to you, Lily. That's great. Well, thank you for sparing the time. I know you're a very, very busy chap. Um, and it's lovely to see you on my screen. I often see you on the BBC at breakfast time. So there you go. <laughs> um, so, Eddie, I, th I think the purpose of today really is to ask you a few questions. Um, so I hope you're sitting comfortably. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you, first of all, what were your experiences during lockdown? And how do you think the pandemics affected practice viability, in your opinion? All right. Well, I mean, uh, right from the outset, when we uh, when we had the lockdown and we had to close our practice, um, sadly, I was I was pretty ill straight away. I, I did catch COVID and um, I was unwell for about two weeks. Um, thankfully, didn't have all the symptoms, didn't have the cough. I had some of the temperature and I had a sore throat and a loss of smell and all that. You know, I thought I'd, uh, I'd been unwell and I thought I'd had COVID. But uh, following on, before we actually started back to work, on the 8th of June, um, Birmingham Dental Hospital carried out a, a big survey of all the dental teams in the Birmingham area and, and carried out uh, antibody testing to see uh, which members of the dental team had actually had COVID. Uh, and I had a confirmation uh, test with them to, to say that I had it, even though I didn't have all the symptoms. But thankfully, I was only unwell for, a, I don't know, about 10 days, but I was really lethargic and feeling very... Uh, under the weather. But um, the situation was that um, it became mad with, mm. with, with remote meetings. I mean, I was, um, I was sort of working longer hours um, outside the surgery than I was in the surgery during those initial weeks when all of that was being planned. Uh, all the meetings were being planned with the BDA and we were trying to negotiate things from a very early stage with NHS England. Um, some days I was working 12 or 13 hours, so, um, I, you know, I was really feeling lethargic, but I, I thought it was probably because I was overworking, but sadly it was because I had COVID. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you realise afterwards, yeah. Wow, long days, of course, and uh, were you working at that time as well? Well, uh, no, thankfully I was very su well supported by the practice. Um, I work in two practices. Uh, on a part-time basis and both of them carried out the triaging on my behalf uh, mm -hmm. and, and helped. I often got a phone call asking for some advice regarding a particular patient or not but I wasn't yeah. needed in the surgery uh, and it gave me some free time actually to get on and do what I needed to do in organising things um, yeah. with, with the, the committee work that we were doing. Wow, so it's been a very challenging time for you really hasn't it? It has, yeah, yeah. You know, in your opinion, how's the pandemic affected practice viability? Um, well, the, the real concern to us was the fact that so many practices obviously don't work on a completely NHS or completely private model. Most practices work with a combination of NHS and private income. Um, and, and so from a very early stage, the British Dental Association carried out a survey of as many of their members as, as they could get hold of. And um, the, the, the results of that were really quite frightening in that obviously a lot of the things that were put in place um, by the Chancellor really dentists fell through the, the net. Um, mm. We weren't we weren't eligible for um, for, for rate rebates. We weren't eligible for some of the self-employed um support that was there because many dentists earn more than 50,000 uh, and a lot of the schemes that were put in place really made dentistry fall through those cracks uh, and and the survey results were really quite startling in the number of practices that thought their viability going forward without any support was going to be really serious and and calling to question the long-term viability of their, den their dental practices. Um, so uh, Thankfully, uh, some of the business interruption support loans that were yeah. there, uh, and, and I think that, that has helped. I mean, I, I know of certain practices in my own location uh, mm. and in, in my own vicinity that have had to, to go to the bank and take overdraft facilities mm. to survive. Life has been incredibly tough, and we've really yeah. been 
quite unsuccessful in actually getting the proper support we need uh, yeah. because if many of these practices go to the wall um you know the, the the real worry is that the nhs which was struggling to actually accommodate the number of patients um pre-covid was certainly have a real problem post-covid yeah. in the fact that a lot of these practices won't be there well that sort of leads me quite nicely into my next question really which was you know and obviously this is your opinion right now but has the pandemic given any opportunity for a re-evaluation of care within the nhs i think it has yeah i, I think um you know, the, the negotiations that have been ongoing between the BDA and the Department of Health and NHS England have really been quite uh, protracted. It's been quite mm -hmm. difficult to get decisions in a timely manner. And it, that's been evidenced by the fact that yeah. many, many practices even now still don't know what their targets are going to be for yeah. the end part of the year. Um, so that's been really quite frustrating in that the levels of um, structure within an within NHS England have made it quite difficult to get rapid decision making. Um, yeah. But what has happened is that there's been lots of negotiation about what's going to happen from April of next year. Uh, and some of the recent negotiations that have been taking place uh, may be that there is an element of flexible commissioning that will be possible from April. Uh, certainly the Chief Dental Officer has put together quite an interesting paper of ideas on how dental practices might be able to accommodate some flexible commissioning from yeah. April 2021 which will give them an, a, a different way of delivering contract because it's pretty clear I think that for quite a considerable time even stretching well into next year actually delivering a UDA uh, mm -hmm. contract is going to be incredibly difficult for most practices. Yeah huge challenges ahead isn't there? Yeah, huge yeah it's not just running the business keeping the lights on it's 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 conforming isn't it to everything that they've got they're up against with the as you say delivery yeah i mean we know many practices even pre-covid uh struggled to actually hit their their 96 percent mm. level of uda activity mm. and that the, the year on year increase in clawback that was happening you know if if we got to a situation where we were returning to a uda contract uh in in a in instill the elements of a pandemic huge numbers of practices the vast majority of practices would not be able to hit anything like that mm. level uh, and if they suffered clawback you know the the already vulnerable financial viability of a dental practice will come yeah. crashing down yeah is the overall uh, feeling of morale how has it been in your experience of talking to dental practitioners how are, how are a lot of the people you're talking to how are they feeling how are they coping yeah, um, well, I think at the start of the pandemic, when we went into the lockdown and we were trying to sort of create urgent dental care centres, the, the camaraderie and the working together of the profession was incredible. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Many local dental committees uh, worked well with NHS England to actually set up structures that were there for patient care. Um, and, and that was the other element of what was happening in lockdown. I was contacted all over social media by huge yeah. numbers of patients that were struggling to yeah. get care. I mean, it, it really did highlight the fact that, you know, the population, when it hasn't got a dental service or, that's there to support them, really, yeah. really misses that. And yeah. dentistry became really quite high profile. As you say, uh, that the amount of media interest mm. in dentistry was huge during the pandemic. Yeah. I um, but I think the longer it's gone on, the harder it's become. I mean, dentists adapted to the new way of working with the uh, with the standard operating procedures and all the additional PPE. Yeah. Um, I'm, I've been amazed uh, and really, uh, you know, it's great to see the profession actually stepping up to the plate yeah. yet again and adapting to completely yeah. new ways of working. Um, but it, it, it's incredibly tiring and very uh, you know, stressful, really treating yeah. patients, doing intricate work with this standard of PPE on. It's it, it's tiring, and many people are getting very, very exhausted. I'm, I'm I'm hopeful that over the Christmas period, many of my colleagues do manage to get a bit of a break. Yeah. Um, but I, I suspect that many won't because the the amount of emergencies that many are still trying to see are yeah. are huge. Yeah. You know, in in the own my, in the practice where I work and provide orthodontic services, I was there this morning, and uh, and they're still not seeing any routine examinations. They're yeah. still trying to deal with the backlog. Yeah. So of course it all just piles up, doesn't it? And then that makes having time off almost counterproductive in a way because you know you're going back to it. But 
as you say, you've, it's it's a tough time for everybody, certainly. I, I think the other thing I would say, Lily, is that mm. the patients at the beginning, when we reopened in June, were in, incredibly grateful that suddenly mm. the service had become available again. But I think the longer it's gone on, the more frustrated patients have become. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and many now expect us to be back up and running as normal. Um, and so the front desk of, uh, of many dental practices is quite a, a traumatic place now for many people yeah. dealing with these uh, conversations on a daily basis. Well, that's right. They're on the front line, aren't they, Eddie? They're dealing with the, with the, the great British public venting their spleen. And that's, <laughs> well, that's what we know sometimes. I mean, you know, overall, this, this whole business for the last year, it's, it's been quite extraordinary. And um, I won't use the word unprecedented. It's so yesterday, isn't it? But it's it's brought out the best in a lot of people as you say and, and we see certainly in our walk of life here um tremendous team support solidarity you know it really has who's on the bus and who's off it and we do see the most extraordinary pulling together of of the dental teams which is a great thing to see um let's just hope that obviously soon 2021 we start to see a real turn around the corner um so Tell me about the BDA. So what have the, what have the BDA been doing to support uh, dentistry? Um, well, as I say, there's been a huge amount of negotiations all around the UK uh, to actually secure the, um, the NHS contracts. And that was one of the areas we've been incredibly successful. We, we, we tried to set up a, um, a system where we could um, arbitrate, where there was disputes with uh, associates and practice owners about about levels of pay, um, that that proved incredibly difficult to actually get up uh, off the ground. We had about five hundred um, uh, colleagues contact in, in the hope of getting some arbitration, but arbitration needs two people to actually uh, work that arbitration, um, and without that. Uh, Co cooperation between the practice owner and the associate, and 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 we 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 know that there's been stories of bad bad practice by both. Really, we've heard of associates that have not been pulling their weight. We've also also heard of of, of practice owners that have acted in a very. Um, a very aggressive and hard way and not being paying people correctly or even actually getting rid of staff and that that has been you know very very distressing uh, so whilst we saw many uh, uh, colleagues working together uh, to actually get things moving we also saw quite a division that's that that, that arose between associates uh, and, and practice owners in thankfully a very small number of practices but that it did happen um and, and we've also seen the fact that the, uh, our private colleagues have felt that the BDA has been completely ineffective in actually supporting private practice. And so we've seen, we've seen the rise of organisations like the British Association of Private Dentistry, um, which uh, we've, we've tried to work alongside to actually um, support our private colleagues. But there is a suspicion that the BDA only cared about the NHS uh, colleagues, well, really, that wasn't the case. Well, the, the, the case was that we were successful in supporting the NHS element and we were very, very unsuccessful in actually supporting the private income of, of our colleagues. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how sometimes, you know, whilst one does the best, it's a perception of people, isn't it, of what you're actually doing, how it comes across. They say perception can be reality. But, you know, that's it's good to hear that, you know, you, you are you feel that the BDA is doing the right thing for the, both the private and the NHS side of things. But well, we, we, I, I would say we've tried, Lily, we have tried extremely hard, uh, but we haven't been successful. Uh, and that's been incredibly frustrating. I mean, yeah. we managed with the BDA to actually get uh, through through members actually lobbying their own MPs to get 101 MPs to write to the Chancellor and ask him to support dental practices, all dental practices, including yeah. private dental practices. But um, they didn't even have the courtesy of a re reply from the Chancellor. Really? I, you know, I, I, know <laughs> I know he's been a busy chap, um, but uh, it's pretty unprecedented for 101 MPs to write to, the, to a minister really? and not get a reply like Nothing that. Nothing at all. Nothing, not even an acknowledgement of their letter. No. Wow, wow. So obviously, I was going to crack the joke about what do you do in your spare time, Eddie? How do you relax? But you've <laughs> obviously got a hell of a week. You're a busy person, but how do you manage to, to cram all this in together and still keep, you know, 
keep well, saying, I, 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 keep... yeah, I think I've always been someone who, who likes to be busy. But I mean, you know, the fourteen hour days of meetings yeah. take its toll, and mm. you know, uh, thankfully, I've managed to get the opportunity of going out and about. I do like walking in the countryside, and yeah. obviously, the one that one of the real benefits of the lockdown period was the weather was particularly good. Yeah. Um, so I did manage, and obviously, with the longer days, managed to get out and do a lot of the walking that yeah. I would like to do to de-stress. Um, mm. As we move into the winter months, that's been more and more difficult. Um, but I still try and get out at the weekends and do some walking. Yeah. It is so important, isn't it? And that's, that's something that we're all working hard on. You've just got to make that time because, uh, you know, you can feel like a hamster in a wheel, can't you? Thundering round, but you've got to take that time out to, to rest. And it's your mental well-being as well. And we're seeing that with a lot of our clients. You know, they're very yeah. stressed. They're very tired. They're exhausted. Um, yeah, the 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 mental health of the profession really has suffered yeah. tremendously. I mean, the, yeah. the BDA has a, a a service for members that's available called Health Assured, which is a, a mental health uh, and stress service. Uh, and, and the numbers have caused into that. Yeah. And other organisations, there's lots of other organisations yeah. uh, across the profession that provide mental health support for colleagues. They've all reported, including people like the Benevolent Fund who have had yeah. massive numbers of people contacting them, you know, in financial difficulty. Um, you know, I, I don't want to use the word unprecedented either, <laughs> Lily, but I mean, the, the, the volume of people yeah. that have been reporting, um, you know, mental health issues and yeah. stress uh, and, and, and sadly, uh, there have been one or two people who have who've taken their own lives. Really? Uh, yeah. Dreadful. Uh, uh, terrible. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's soul destroying when it gets to the situation where people really are so badly affected that they, the only way out for them is to do yeah. that. But, uh, I mean, we've always had uh, an element of uh, suicide, sadly, in the dental profession, but I'm sure it's exacerbated it. Interestingly, you know, we, we are very busy but the people that, that are coming to us to are saying we're ready to sell it's not through financial um, necessity it's because they feel that they just don't have the emotional capacity the stomach for facing another couple of years ahead of them and they decide that now is the time to perhaps you know um, get the plans in motion and start looking towards retirement or selling or what have you or just just you know freeing themselves of the chore of ownership because all the pressures it brings with it that's what we're actually seeing not people who are hitting the buffers financially and having to sell um people just some some clients just feel that you know this is this is the time to go perhaps sooner than they envisaged but they're ready to go um so obviously, well, you know, you're doing an amazing work there, I know. I know how hard you work. But thank you very much for your time. It's been really enlightening to hear about what you're doing, you know, from the horse's mouth, so to speak. No, Lily, it's been a real pleasure speaking to you. And I, I, I'd like to, on behalf of the British Dental Association, wish uh, dentists and their teams across the country and across the UK a very happy Christmas and let's hope that uh, 2021 is a far better year for everyone. Eddie thank you ever so much um, I very much hope we can perhaps pick up another chat in the springtime of next year and see how things are going certainly in your world um, it's, it's a constant moving feast isn't it with with news with legislation NHS England and all the rest of it um, so it just leaves me to say on behalf of all of the team and myself, Eddie, thank you very much indeed for your time today. I do appreciate it. I know how busy you are. I wish you a happy Christmas. Um, and to our listeners, our valued clients, obviously, I hope you've enjoyed this podcast today. Um, do keep following our Dental Business Transaction podcasts. They're easily downloadable on our website, lilyhead.co.uk. And you can also get them through Podbean, Spotify and YouTube. Um, don't hesitate to call our team anytime for any advice, any discussions around any subject matter and we can be easily reached at dentalbrokers at lilyhead.co.uk or you can call the team on 033 772 0654.